Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks very much indeed for coming. Um, I'm delighted to welcome our guest today, uh, Majid Nawaz, uh, who has just published this book, uh, Radical. And it's a, Majid's story is a, a fascinating one in that he got involved as a, a young man in uh, radical Islam uh, and uh, ended up in prison in Egypt for his views and then subsequently uh, had a conversion uh, and rejected uh, political Islam, although he remains a Muslim, uh, and now campaigns around the world for in favor of, of democracy and uh, nonviolent uh, methods. I'm particularly interested in, in sharing this uh, discussion because I've actually met Majid in both his incarnations. Uh, when I was at, at uh, Newsnight a few years ago, we did a, a, an item about Hizbut Tahrir, which was the organization that Majid was a, a member of. And uh, he came into the program and, we, and complained long into the night about the, um, the film. And we, we sort of discussed that until well after midnight, I think. And then when he decided to take a, a new path, he phoned us up and said, uh, I am, I'm basically converting and I'm going to change <coughs> my approach uh, completely. Uh, and he asked if he could make a film about that change uh, on Newsnight, uh, which we very quickly said, absolutely, and uh, the, the film went out. So welcome, Maggie. It's great to have you here. Um, so really, let's go back to let's go back to South End. And, and how did you get involved with extremism in the first place? First of all, thank you for that introduction. And um, I've mentioned Peter in the book because of the story that he's just mentioned. Um, and uh, it was uh, very kind of you to actually give me the opportunity to come back and set the record straight. So, uh, so and thank you for agreeing to, to chair this event uh, today. <coughs> My journey to uh, an Islamist organization began, I was born and raised in Essex, and my journey began uh, in my teenage years. I, I grew up in a very, with a very integrated background. In fact, all of my friends were white Essex boys, um, and uh, we had little problem with racism until I became a teenager. Um, but when I hit the age of around 14 years old, um, because of a phenomenon that was called white flight, now for any of you who are not from England or London, white flight was something that was used as a term to describe uh, white people moving from East London to get away from increasing immigration and moving as far east as they could go. Now, of course, the furthest east is South End, because beyond that, there's the sea. Uh, so when they went as far east as they could go to get away from the immigration, they found me in South End, which is where I was born, and they didn't expect that. So in those days, uh, I think South End was about 99.5% white. Uh, so I had, you know, all my friends were English and, and white people, and so I basically didn't know anything else. And I became, uh, I, I experienced a rude awakening. I became suddenly aware of my skin, skin color. And I describe it in, in Radical as a way that when, you, when I look at people, when I look at you, when I look and talk to people, uh, I don't see my own skin color. I see, uh, I see people in front of me, and I see them as human beings. And the racist is forever seeing me and defining me by the color of my skin, uh, and was, would view the color of that skin as a target. And in those days, there was a phenomenon. Now, I, I'm saying all this. This is the beginning of the story. Please don't get me wrong. Racism is no longer as severe a problem in the UK as it used to be. And I have to say that point. I mean, things are much better than they used to be. But in those days, uh, there were people that would engage in what they called packy bashing. And what that is, is that they would ride around in white vans. Um, and they would randomly jump out the back of these vans to attack anyone of, uh, of, a, of a brown complexion that they saw in an unprovoked and totally without warning attack. And these attacks would usually be with hammers uh, and with screwdrivers and with kebab knives. And so at the age of 14, I began experiencing or being a target of this sort of packy bashing on the streets of Essex. And it would occur on many occasions. One of my friends called... Uh, 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 Mo Giddings was uh, chased down the seafront with a hammer, um, had a, a hammer attack to his head. Um, and we were targeted on many occasions, and on many occasions I had to watch my friends stabbed and slashed at with knives by these, uh, by these racists. Um, and this was all happening at the same time where, while Essex police authorities, uh, before the days of the Stephen Lawrence murder, before the days of the McPherson report that exposed a level of institutional racism in the police forces in this country, we were living that type of institutional racism. So uh, on many occasions, we were the target of police discrimination, as well as being targeted on the streets of Essex for our skin color. Uh, one time, my brother, who was 16, was playing with a toy gun in the park. 
and a lady saw him and decided that he must be about to rob a bank and reported him to the police. I joined him later on in the evening as, as a 15 year old and we went to, to play snooker uh, and we were on the way back home um, in our friend's car who was 17 and therefore old enough to drive and the police had blocked the roads and there was a police helicopter flying above us and they shone a spotlight onto our car um, and uh, suddenly from uh, either side of the car came these armed uh, policemen with uh, sub, sub semi-automatic machine guns. They put guns to our heads and they dragged us out of the car and said you're being arrested for suspicion of armed robbery. Um, I was too young to be interrogated uh, without the presence of a, an, a, an adult, so they called my poor mother at 3 a.m. in the morning and woke her up and said, both your sons have been arrested for suspicion of armed robbery and you have to come down to the station because we can't interview, we can't interrogate the younger one without your presence. And, and your response to that was then to turn to extreme Islam, was it? One more thing happened and that was Bosnia. So with the genocide in Bosnia, um, what I had previously associated as racist violence, I began seeing as something a bit deeper because of course in Bosnia there were white, blonde haired, blue eyed Muslims who were being targeted by the Serbs because of their faith. Uh, and so what all of this led to isn't me joining Hizb al-Tahrir. It led to me becoming very disenfranchised and disconnected from society. What then led me to join Hizb al-Tahrir once I was already primed is the final ingredient that you need to join the dots of the grievances that one experienced. And that's the ideological narrative. And so I met a recruiter who joined those dots and, 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 and basically gave me an alterna alternative discourse to explain away all of these grievances. Now tell us a little bit about Hizb al-Tahrir because they are an organisation who effectively want to overthrow governments right around the world and impose a, an Islamic <coughs> state. So founded in 1953 in Jerusalem, Hizb al-Tahrir has three aims. Um, but first of all, I'll say it's an Islamist organisation. What is Islamism and how is it different to Islam? Is Islam is a religion, it's a faith, and every Muslim has the right to practice their religion, whether in the, its conservative form or in its reformist form. Uh, Islamism, on the other hand, is the desire to impose an interpretation of that faith over society as law. And that's the difference. The desire to impose an interpretation of Islam over society is the politicization of religion, and that's why we add the suffix ism, ism to the end, so it's called Islamism. Hizb al-Tahrir is an Islamist organization. Um, it seeks to overthrow every single Muslim majority regime so it can impose its interpretation of Islam. It also seeks to uh, create uh, as a result, a pan-Islamist superstate, an expansionist state that will rule the world, and the final aim is to destroy the state of Israel. How they aim to get to power, there's three different groups of methodologies within Islamist organizations. We have the Muslim Brotherhood variety in Egypt, they aim to get to power through competing in elections and participating in the, in the political system. Then the second category are those who are the revolutionary Islamist organizations, like the group I belong to, and they aim to recruit army officers, serving army officers from the armies of Muslim majority countries, so they can incite military coups. And they've done that, and I participated in that level of incitement across a couple of countries in the world. And the third type, the third category, are the terrorist Islamist organizations. So I joined a revolutionary Islamist organization. And it, it, it treaded a, 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 a fine line, didn't it, this organization? This is where we got into, into heated yeah. debate. Because it, it's not a terrorist organization, but is it a violent organization? So there is a level of violence that is not defined as terrorism. For example, a military coup is inherently a violent act. When you attempt to overthrow a government using an army, the fact is the army is threatening force if the government doesn't comply. Now, if that's a de democratic regime, then it's an illegal act to even encourage that. And so in that sense, they're, they're, they're encouraging violence, but they're not encouraging terrorism, meaning they, they will condemn and not condone attacks on hotels, nightclubs, and these sorts of things. So it's a more focused level of violence. Once they, aim, once they come to power, they then aim to use the fact that a state has a monopoly over violence to uh, engage in a very aggressive and violent foreign policy of war, and they appropriate the term jihad, which is a Quranic concept to mean struggle, and they apply it to their foreign policy. And it's all based on sales, isn't it? And you, and you were actually a cell recruiter, weren't you? Well, what does that involve? So I, I went through the ranks. I started off as a recruiter in Newham College. I became president of the Students' Union and was involved in a heavy recruitment drive for the group. Uh, my entire student union committee were members of my organization who were elected on the same slate as I was. And we ratcheted up and poisoned the atmosphere to such an extent that sadly, though we didn't in encourage this directly, but it's a natural consequence of what I believe is, uh, is if you boil a kettle enough, eventually the water will bubble over. 
Uh, one of our supporters called Saeed Noor ended up murdering a non-Muslim student on that campus by stabbing him through the heart with a machete. And he was convicted for murder and is serving a life sentence. He was not a member of the group. He was a, he was a supporter who, as I said, when you ratchet up the atmosphere, it's like if racism spreads unchecked in society, then don't be surprised if Combat 18 and other racist groups start engaging in violence. And so that's the fine line you mentioned. And that was the debate we had when I was still a member of the group, that they, they don't directly encourage violence. And that was the point I was pushing and also obviously was bound to push mm -hmm. when you were editor of, uh, of Newsnight. I was arguing a legal point that they don't necessarily encourage violence directly. But what I was concealing was the fact that this point, that you know, just like with racism, if you spread an extremist idea and if you spread hatred and bigotry in society, then a natural consequence, don't be surprised if people then you know, allow that to spill over and take matters into their own hands. And then this led to you going to Egypt and to getting into trouble there. So before I went to Egypt, I, I, I was a co-founder of this group in, in, three other, in three, well, two other countries apart from Britain. So I went to Denmark and helped establish the Danish Pakistani branch. When Pakistan adopted, when Pakistan tested its nuclear bomb, we got a message from the global leader saying that, um, that the, the super state that they wanted to create would really benefit from a nuclear bomb. So he sent a message to all British Pakistani members and asked us to leave our studies. At the time, I was doing law and Arabic at university at SOAS. Um, if we could leave our studies and, and go over as quickly as possible to Pakistan to recruit from the Pakistani army um, and recruit from the population to prime Pakistan as being the starting point for this so-called caliphate. Again, another appropriation of an Islamic term, uh, a historical term that they've now used to call their super state. So I left in 99 and I moved to Pakistan and began recruiting there. Um, I, I sort of tried to uh, well, I co-founded the group there and, and set up cells in Lahore and in, and in Rahim Yar Khan and other cities. Um, and also recruited, helped recruit Pakistani army officers to the group who were discovered in 2003 by General Musharraf in a purge because they were plotting a coup. Um, and even this year, they've discovered a third cell of my group, my former group in the Pakistani army, Brigadier Ali Khan and four other officers who are currently um, facing a military tribunal again for plotting a coup. And, and media reports state that, in fact, there was, an, uh, there was a recruit from the Air Force who was even considering bombing the parliament as a distraction when they, uh, when they uh, attempt to engage in this coup. After my activities in Pakistan, I ended up in Egypt. And in Egypt, I, I was um, head of the Alexandria chapter and, uh, and was attempting to resurrect and, and recreate this group in, in Egypt. And it was in Egypt after 9-11 that the authorities um, well, my activities caught up with me and, and the authorities arrested me. So uh, on the 1st of April in 2002, I was uh, arrested in Alexandria. I was blindfolded. I was uh, taken to the dungeons of the state security headquarters in Cairo in a building known as Al-Gihaz. Uh, my hands were tied behind my back with rags and I was given a number. My number was 42 and the numbers went into the hundreds. And it was there in the building of Al-Gihaz that they began torturing everybody by electrocution going up from number one to number two to number three, all the way uh, into the hundreds. And we were uh, eventually sentenced to um, five years in prison. I wanted to actually read an extract sure. um, from, could I just borrow sure, your sure. book, please? <laughs> With pleasure. Um, I thought that what I'd do is just read from that section of my time in, in Al-Gihaz. Um, it's not long, just a page, because um, it just gives you a feeling, it's very difficult to describe walking towards your torture, to your own torture, I wasn't electrocuted, thankfully. I, I need to make that point clear. I was instead subjected to having to um, witness other people electrocuted, and then my questions were being played off them and vice versa. Um, but uh, at the time that I was walking towards the torture cell, uh, to the interrogation room, I didn't know, because of course they had tortured other, another British citizen who was with me. So I didn't know if they were uh, going to electrocute me or not. And this is what I tried to do is explain how that feels um, in the book when you're walking towards uh, what could be uh, a very difficult situation to deal with. So this chapter is from chapter 20. It's, uh, uh, it's called Aslamu Alaikum, You've Just Come Out of Hell, because Al-Gihaz was, was a building infamous throughout Egypt. And during the Egypt uprising, uh, the, the revolutionaries in fact stormed this building and they ransacked it and they took the files. Um, it's a, it's, there are two buildings that are infamous in Egypt for torture, and they were the, respectively the headquarters, the Cairo headquarters for Amin Adola, or the state security, and the Egypt headquarters. Al-Gihaz was the national Egypt headquarters, and La Zughli was a building that was the Cairo headquarters. And just merely mentioning the names, if anyone is uh, Egyptian in the audience, um, you'd know, merely mentioning Al-Gihaz and La Zughli would be enough to, to send uh, a shiver down the spine of any Egyptian 
uh, they were truly uh, dark and despicable uh, places. So if you bear with me, this is a, it's a very difficult passage. When I wrote this, it was actually, I, I had a bit of a breakdown, but, um, but uh, it's so, I'm just going to read it for you because it gives you a, a sense of what it feels like to be in that situation. To be asked to voluntarily walk towards your own torture is the cruelest of expectations. Why can't they just carry me? Each step is a personal betrayal. My body is convulsing in revulsion against my commands. Every instinct is screaming at me to turn the other way. But I'm expected to walk on. Try standing in the middle of a highway watching an oncoming bus without flinching. That's hard. Now try voluntarily walking towards that bus instead of stepping out of the way. Impossible. That's what it's like walking towards your own torture. My legs are buckling under each step, but I force compliance and walk on. Guard, your chaperoning hand that helps me walk blindly to my own torture feels perversely merciful. For how could I avoid stepping on my brothers in the corridor were it not for you? Alas, without sight, I cannot help but feel so disgustingly dependent on you. Now it is hard to breathe. Fighting to stay hidden away deep within me, even my breath fears coming out to face my torturer. My heart is attempting to escape the cage that is my chest and my mind is beginning to shut down. I'm in shock. Oh God, I need you right now. If any mercy I've ever shown to anyone has amounted to any value in your esteem, then send me your angels now to shield me from these monsters. I'm trying to be brave for you, my Lord, but the truth is I am scared. Help me, my Lord, for I am very scared. As I said, that's from chapter 20, and that's, that's uh, just before I was, my number was called, number 42, and it's just before I was uh, called to the torture cell. And then uh, after four days, we were then put into solitary confinement um, in a concrete cell with no uh, sanitation, and, no, and that means no toilet, and no bed, and no light, and no sink. Um, and eventually we were sentenced to five years in prison. And did you spend five years in prison? I spent my full sentence, which um, was meant to be three years and nine months. It took them an extra three months to sort their paperwork out. Um, so I re returned after serving four years. The prison was Mazra'atura prison. Um, anyone who follows the Egypt uprising will know that uh, Hosni Mubarak's sons and the former Minister of Interior, Habib Adli, and Hosni Mubarak himself are currently serving in that very same prison. I thank God that they weren't tortured and that, that, that what happened to Gaddafi didn't happen to them because, of course, uh, it, it, we, we, as Nietzsche said, beware of, the, of becoming the monster you're attempting to fight. And when I became an Islamist, I did become somewhat uh, of that monster. And I'm happy that I've managed to pull myself back from that level of anger. So then, how did you start to change your mind? Was it around this time? That you, you can have your book back. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, two things happened to me in, in, in Mazrat or a prison that had a profound impact on me. Uh, uh, one of them was that uh, Amnesty International, uh, to whom I owe a great deal of thanks for their support, they adopted me as a prisoner of conscience. If you, if you keep in mind the way in which we spoke earlier, that there are three categories of Islamist organizations. My one was a non-terrorist organization. And, and, and specifically in this case, there were no charges of violence. The, the charges in Arabic were, uh, they're quite comical actually. Tarweej bil qawli wal kitab li jama'atin ghayri mashru'a, which means propagation by speech and writing for the ideas of a banned organization. So we were charged for ideas. And so the charge in itself was an own goal. And that spurred Amnesty on. There was a man called John Cornwall, who is a part of the Amnesty's Buckingham branch. And he began writing letters to their headquarters, uh, asking them to adopt us as prisoners of conscience. And he had a, an impact, and they did. When, as soon as we were charged by these dodgy charges, um, now I've got to say again, we were extreme. Uh, we were, we did believe in unpalatable and, uh, and, and, uh, and reprehensible ideas, but that's different to actually doing something illegal, and it's also different to being a terrorist. Uh, uh, and, and part of the reason I'm doing the work I'm doing now um, is to make amends for the extremism uh, that I spread. So I just want to make that point clear. Yeah. But, but when but Amnesty... When, but when did you yeah. realize you, that what you were doing was reprehensible? When did that dawn on you? So this was a, it wasn't a, there was no sudden moment. There was a four-year process and, a, and one year after prison. Uh, and as I said, the, so the two things that really helped change my mind is Amnesty working to campaign for my release. That, that began a rehumanization process. Um, I began defining the other as no longer as my enemy because, of course, they were defending me. And, and there's a lesson there in the importance of adhering to human rights. You know, the war on terror decade, uh, I think, had it the wrong way around. You know, they ba basically started cutting back on human rights and going in heavy with the military, whereas what should have happened is a heavy civic response 
to extremism and a protection of civil liberties. But anyway, that's another so subject. But that had a profound impact on me. The second thing was that I was in prison at the time with some of the leading jihadists and Islamists uh, of their day in Egypt. Everything from, on the one end, uh, one end of the spectrum, the assassins of the former president, Anwar Sadat, through to the Muslim Brotherhood leadership, Dr. Mohammed Badir, who's their current uh, Murshid al-Am, or their general leader. And that's the party that's now, uh, sort of their candidate won the presidential elections in Egypt. They're now in power. All the way through to liberal politi political prisoners, such as Dr. Saadadin Ibrahim and Ayman Noor, the former presidential candidate. And so it's essentially the four years in university was a political university. And I, everything I've told you that I did, I did before the age of 24. So I was imprisoned at 24. I'm now only 25, believe it or not. <laughs> um, no, I'm 34. So uh, at 24, I was in prison. So I was still very young. And it was those four years that basically was my uh, political maturity, political awakening from 24 to 28. The amnesty's work and my political discussions in prison, prison and my studying from Islam's original sources. I became fluent in Arabic, uh, not only because I did the law and Arabic degree at SOAS, but also because by that time, obviously in prison, I had to speak Arabic every day. Um, so I began studying from the Quran and the original sources of Islam, and I realized that um, this distinction between Islam as a religion and Islamism as a modern political ideology inspired by European fascism, ironically enough. Um, and so after my release from prison, it took me a further 10 months, and I, I, I could no longer justify you met me during that 10 months. Yes. And I could no longer justify believing in those ideas. But you, you, you had changed in your mind, but you hadn't changed publicly. That's right. That right? So yeah, you were still yeah. representing Hizbut Tahrir. On their leadership, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but you, you, you knew you were on the wrong path. Yeah. So I had a BBC Hard Talk interview with Sarah Montague while I was still a member, during the mm -hmm. time I met you. And um, I towed the party line in as far as I could. It's still on the internet if you wanted to watch it. Um, you'll see me speaking as a Hizbut Tahrir member. Um, but I was roundly criticized inside the group for that interview because they said it was too soft. Mm -hmm. And that was me struggling with my own. So I, for example, I used the term, rep we, I said, we're calling for a representative caliphate. And they took, a, they, they basically took issue with my use of the word representative. They said, what do you mean a representative caliphate? It's God's law. God's the one who represents us. So it was, you know, it wasn't, they weren't happy with that. And that was like, they could see that my, my views were, were changing a bit. And like we've met again, I actually on, do you want to hard talk again next week, uh, sort of for the first time since leaving. Uh -huh. So then, uh, where, how did you make the break, and, and how did that go down with his victory? Um, they asked me to, they pretty much were pre preparing me to take over the, the leadership of the group in the UK. Um, the man who originally recruited me was, at, by this time, the leader, um, and he needed to go to Bangladesh uh, to help found the group in Bangladesh. Incidentally, there's also been a, an army purge in Bangladesh. They found, they found a cell in the Bangladeshi army plotting a coup. So they offered that, and I, I was forced to make a decision, either become the leader of the, of the group in the country, that I, and I no longer believe in the group, or, or leave. So I unilaterally resigned. Um, and then I guess the only other question is, why didn't I keep quiet after my resignation? Mm -hmm. I think that what drove me to join the group in the first place was a desire to seek justice and fight the injustices that I saw around me. I now came to believe that the ideology of Islamism is as big an injustice as racism and all the other grievances, including foreign policy grievances that are out there. I believe that the ideology of Islamism is one of the biggest obstacles standing before um, Muslims and their progress. And so that sense that, the, that, that Islamism is creating more injustice than it's solving meant that my original motivation was still there. I needed, I wanted to fight injustice and it, it, the target had just shifted towards this ideology now as well. And did, did that put you at risk, do you think, when you came out? I mean, you, you did, a, I think it was a 17-minute film on Newsnight denouncing his career and then obviously doing speaking program and so on. Have you had threats or intimidation as a result? There are threats, there are intimidation. I mean, yeah, just today someone on Twitter said they wanted to shoot me and if they saw me in the audience, they'd come up and kill me. This is because I did a talk yesterday. The threat, we get threats all the time, but I don't know how serious they are. I have been attacked in Pakistan by a member of the group. But keep in mind, this isn't a terrorist organization. The bigger danger is it comes from, because I'm not just criticizing his Tahrir, I'm criticizing the entire Islamist project that I no longer agree with, um, and separating it from Islam. And that's very dangerous for them, because Islamists believe they have a monopoly over Islamic discourse. And the minute you separate their ideology from the faith, you're, 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 you're removing that monopoly. You're breaking up that monopoly. So it upsets all Islamist organizations. And so the bigger danger is from the violent ones. Um, you know, we, we, we do a lot of work in, in Pakistan now to try and 
challenge the Islamist narrative and uh, inoculate young people against the extremist narratives and instead advocate for democratic culture. I founded a movement in Pakistan mirroring my founding of Islamist movements. I've used the same tactics and the same organizational techniques to set up a, a social movement that advocates instead democratic culture. And in fact, uh, a leading member of that movement is here with me today, is there, Imran Khan, who's on the leadership. Just stick your hand up, Imran. If anyone wants to ask him about Pakistan afterwards, he's on the leadership of the movement we founded there called Khudi. He's here for a week just to sort of see how things are in the UK. Um, but, but we travel around and, and hold workshops in universities with students. We inoculate them against the extremist narratives. We train them in how to distinguish between Islam and Islamism. We're trying to popularize the counter narratives and rebrand democratic activism in Pakistan. Um, and so, of course, it is dangerous. Um, but I think the bigger danger is uh, pe facing people like Imran who are out on the front lines every day. I'm just providing my consultancy services, if you like. <laughs> so, th so that's the Quilliam Foundation. Yeah. That right? and, yeah. and that's kind of interesting because there's a, there's a number of people, Ed Hussein and, and, and some others, who kind of had conversions around about the same time and banded together. So why was it that these, these guys all came to the same conclusion around the same time and found Quilliam? There was some, there was, so Ed and I founded Quilliam together and then we brought, as you said, we brought a number of guys on board. Um, there was something of a perfect storm in those days and, and the, the perfect storm was that the public appetite to understand the difference between Islam and Islamism was at its peak. Um, it was post 7-7. Policy makers were hungry for this distinction and to understand the debate. Uh, there was uh, 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 funds available in terms of public funds um, to try and address some of these subjects. Ed has just written his book explaining um, his views around this, these themes. And, uh, and all of that came together and I just got released from prison. And of course my story um, being out of the, the group, being the only one who had gone on to become a bit of an international Islamist and sort of imprisoned and stuff, it added the extra spice, if you like, to the masala to, to create that sort of you know, background, backstory. And it, it was a perfect storm. I don't think we could replicate it today. I don't think we could replicate founding Quilliam. We could probably replicate founding Khudi in Pakistan. But founding Quilliam in the UK as a policy-based institution dealing with addressing some of these issues on a policy and media and, and public diplomacy level uh, I, I don't know if that same level of, uh, or the same level of opportunities that we found uh, would present themselves today. And are you succeeding? Do you, th do you think the, the threat of, of radical Islam is receding in Britain? That's tough to say. Jonathan Evans, the head of the security services, just gave a speech two weeks ago, if you caught that, um, warning that the, Arab up, the, the security vacuum from the Arab uprisings uh, could be exploited and is, in his view, I'm sure he'd know, is being exploited um, by... British Muslims going over to train with Al-Qaeda. Um, now, the Arab uprisings were great news. I believe, uh, not only because they were personally cathartic, you know, Hosni Mubarak was brought to justice, but I believe that in the long term, this is a step to the right side of history. I believe that closed societies breed closed minds, and open and democratic societies will, in the long run, breed open and democratic minds. But how to make sure they remain open uh, and not become elected dictatorships? And, and to have that, we need to have the democratic trinity uh, I often refer to. And that's the need for a democratic culture, uh, meaning the ideas and values that underpin uh, democracy, such as human rights and freedoms, the democratic institutions, such as parliament and the Senate, and the democratic processes. If, if this democratic trinity can be rooted within societies such as Egypt or Pakistan, um, then they will act as the strongest check against any one party dominating politics, even an Islamist party. And that's what we're trying to seed in Pakistan, this democratic, uh, democratic trinity, is what we're trying to seed in Pakistan with our social movement, Khudi. But Egypt doesn't have an equivalent level of social organizing for democratic values. It's, it's quite disparate at the moment. So, so Jonathan Evans gave a speech saying that British Muslims may exploit the security vacuum from the Arab uprisings in countries like Yemen, Somalia, uh, Libya, and Syria, especially Syria, because of its proximity to Iraq and former militants coming from Iraq into Syria to fight Assad. And he said there's a chance, and they are aware of, some people coming back and potentially trying to attack Britain. Now, it's not a, a huge leap of the imagination to remember that 7-7 um, occurred during the week we won the Olympics bid, and that now we're about to come into the Olympics. It would be hugely symbolic if there was a terrorist strike in London. I don't think it's a matter of if. I think it's a matter of when and where. I hope and believe that it wouldn't be successful, but I definitely think that there will be attempts. In fact, there have already been arrests um, a couple of cases, one non-Olympics-related non terrorism arrest, a group of six, and one Olympics-related Somali who had fought in Somalia with Al-Shabaab. So I think you know, it's not about if, but when and where. 
sadly. Okay, thank you. Now, should we throw it open to the audience? Who would like to ask some questions? Hi, uh, my name is Eleanor Davis. I'm uh, I'm Israeli. I've been shaking most of the most of the time while you're talking. I have to kind of collect myself. I have I have two questions for you. Um, the first one is I read that you went to meet um, Israeli families, uh, bereaved families that have are victim of of uh, terror um, terror attacks that, that Israel unfortunately has has a lot of. And I wanted to ask you how how you how 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 you were received, how it made you feel, and um, and also ask you what your thoughts are on um, terror organizations such as Hamas and Hezbollah, um, who are very focused on uh, destroying Israel. And then my second question to you was uh, regarding the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, as you said, Arab Spring uh, is something that brought a lot of hope, uh, but from an Israeli perspective, uh, looking at the Muslim Brotherhood, um, who have very difficult uh, opinions, um, and um, there's, there's been a lot of quotations recently in Israeli news um, about um, whether to keep the peace with Israel or not, and, and calls to destroy Israel and, and so on, um, which, which isn't a very hopeful or, or spring-like um, for us. So I was, I was hoping to get your, your opinion on that as well. And then I just want to end by saying thank you so much um, for, for being who you are. And I just wish we had more like you. Thank you. Um, I've just, indeed, you're correct. You probably read it in the Jewish Chronicle. Um, no, I actually read Israeli news. Oh, was it in the, it was, was in the Israeli paper? Ah, OK, I didn't know that. Because I, I, I wrote that in the Jewish Chronicle. Um, I didn't realize the Israeli press covered it, which is good, I suppose, as well. Um, I've just returned from both Israel and the West Bank. In Israel, I met with Mark Regev, the spokesman for Netanyahu. I also met with our own ambassador there, Matthew Gould, and met with Hossam Zomlet from the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank in, in Ramallah. Um, so we did a, a, a full tour. I was part of a parliamentary delegation uh, that went. And as you've correctly said, I met with um, victims of terror. Uh, and the experience was, uh, was very fulfilling uh, for me. Um, the whole rehumanization process is what I, uh, because of Amnesty's work, is what I play a lot, put a lot of emphasis on. I think rehumanization of the other is crucial, and face-to-face -face contact is one of the best ways to do that. But, but not only face-to-face -face contact. What, what is also needed is to actually start, respectively, to start challenging some of the extremisms that exist within one's own communities. And that's why, uh, to take responsibility for, for, for some of the ideas I put out there, I'm doing the work I'm doing now. Um, Hamas and Hezbollah, there is absolutely no excuse and no justification, no matter how angry somebody is, to deliberately target civilians and non-combatants uh, in revenge or to achieve any foreign policy objective whatsoever. Um, I spoke in Israel, and I, I, I say the same here, when an individual or a non-state actor targets civilians or non-combatants, I define it as terrorism, whoever they are, even if it's Hamas and Hezbollah, and when a state does so, I describe it as a war crime. And because of the position I'm in, you'll understand, I have to be very, uh, I have to try and be, and be perceived to be very fair. So we, I, I regularly write in the newspapers against Hamas. I consider Hamas a terrorist organization. And I believe the true chance for peace in uh, the Israel-Palestine conflict is by strengthening the successes of the Palestinian Authority. I saw some of the projects they're involved in, such as the new development site called Rawabi, which is the first time in history that they're building a planned city in the West Bank. It's a Qatari-funded project, and it's, it's a great project. It's, I had a tour. It's a, it's a hugely successful thing if, it, if they pull it off. I think that that's the solution in strengthening the Palestinian Authority. So I write against Hamas and Hezbollah's terrorism in, in the papers, but I also, I won't make any qualms about it, was critical of Israel's Gaza operation, the one where they were bombing Gaza, uh, I think a year ago, whenever it was, because I believe that, yeah, two years ago, I think the, the reaction was disproportionate. But I do draw a distinction between terrorism and a disproportionate state reaction, which in international law is called disproportionate reaction. I hope that answers your question. But thank you as well for your, for your kind comments. OK, so I, 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 because of other questions, what I'll say is the democratic trinity is what's needed to be uh, rooted in Egyptian society. If we can do that, then there will be a check on any one party taking over 
or having an undue influence in Egyptian politics. And finally, there is some cause for hope. Don't, don't forget, only 25% of the population voted for an Islamist party. That's 75% that did not vote for the Brotherhood. And that's a 50% drop from their parliamentary results. If you remember, in Parliament, they got 50%. In the presidential elections, they only got 25%. Within the space of a few months, the percentage dropped. And that's because the majority of Egyptians realize the difference between Islam and Islamism, because they have to live it. Next question. Hi. Um, first of all, thanks for coming. It's great. A pleasure. Thank you for having me. And I have three questions. Uh, <laughs> Is that OK with our chair? Yeah, yeah. be quick, though. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So you were a rec recruiter. What would you say to a person, to one person that you recruited? Um, because you, I guess you use some arguments, some something to convince these people. Uh, so what you will say to those uh, people now? Uh, this is my question number one. Uh, my question number two is: um, in, Are you afraid? Uh, do, do you think your life is in danger after this change in your life and publishing writing this book? Um, and the third question is um, where do you think this is Arabic Spring will come, uh, will end up? Um, and also one thing is that your book is available in Play Store, so, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> OK. What's Play Store? Forgive my ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> a, very, a, a very good um, online oh, store. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Play Store. <laughs> Thumbs up to that. Mm -hmm. um, my, my, uh, I think it's easy to deal with uh, the second question first, my life uh, being in danger or not. I mean, it may be, it may not be. Uh, everyone's life's in danger, you know, in that sense, because, you know, anything could happen. But uh, the reason I'm sounding slightly flippant, forgive me, about that question is because um, when you are a member of an Islamist organization in Hosni Mubarak's Egypt, facing uh, potential torture, um, or death for your Islamist activities, you're already pretty much desensitized to that level of danger. So I'm not doing anything more dangerous now than I was when, uh, when known systematic, systematic torturers were hunting me down in Egypt. Um, so uh, anything that terrorists could do to me now is what the state security could have done to me before. So in that sense, I pretty much have reconciled myself to it already 13 years ago. Um, your first question about the, what I say to somebody, I mean, I don't think we have the time to do, but I am involved in that. I am engaged in that. And um, just recently, I managed to, I had some good news. I managed to convince uh, a member of an Islamist organization from a leadership position to resign and step down and also denounce the Islamist ideology because they're not the same thing. You could leave the Communist Party and still be a communist. So that the key is to actually convince them to leave the ideology as well. Um, so I am engaged in that. As for your third question, I'm optimistic in the long term about the Arab uprisings. And I think Libya, for example, and the elections that just happened there. It's great. I mean, the, the Islamists didn't win in Libya. And even in Egypt, as I said, only 25% voted for the Islamist candidate. Um, and that was because they were actually rejecting Hosni Mubarak's last PM, because the final runoff ended up ironically being between the old order and the new order. And there's no surprise there. They happen to be the most organized blocs within a disorganized majority, uh, Mubarak's cronies and the Muslim Brotherhood. So th this election was actually a rejection of the old and nothing more. Um, so I'm optimistic in the long term. Next question. Forgive me, I'm trying to rush through the yes, questions, but uh, I hope you don't mind. Just one at a time, yeah. is preferred. So, um, uh, I saw your BBC interview. I think it was 2006. I didn't know it was when you were going through the transformation. But I wanted to just uh, ask a quick question on that. You, uh, Which so BBC interview do you refer to? The Sarah Montague, is that right? The Hard Talk. Hard Talk, Hard talk yeah. Yeah, OK. So in that one, you had mentioned that um, maybe it was you being soft, but you had mentioned that you were trying to uh, just encourage Islamic governments to unite, and I didn't see much wrong with that. Uh, you, you had defended that idea, and I was in, in agreement with that specific idea. So I just wanted to know if uh, you are again, against that idea now, because okay. that seems not... That's a, are you from Pakistan? No, I'm not. I'm from India. From India. Uh, it's a good question. Um, and, and the reason... I, what I did is, I remember the analogy I drew was with the EU. With the, I said, if the European Union can come together, why can't Muslim countries come together and form a caliphate? I'd like to tell you now that that analogy is false. And you'll understand why it's false, because you're in London. And the reason it's false is, if you look at me, I carry a British passport, and I have a Pakistani um, uh, identity card as well. I can go in and out. That's called citizenship. Now, as a Muslim of Pakistani origin, born in Essex, I'm a member of the EU citizens, and I'm a member of, I'm a citizen of Britain. Britain didn't say to me that because you're not a Muslim, you can't be a citizen. Britain said, you're a British citizen. 
Um, in this country, we have uh, a Muslim in the cabinet, serving in the cabinet, regardless of one's views about her. I'm not a Tory, and I, you know, but Baroness Warris is in the cabinet. In the opposition, we have a Muslim in the shadow cabinet, and that's Sadiq Khan, who incidentally, by the way, or for the record, was my lawyer campaigning for my release from prison. Um, so I need to thank him for that on the record. Um, and in the Lib Dems as well. Muslims serve in all three parties as citizens of this country. Why am I telling you this? Because there's a difference between the citizenship model that doesn't look at ethnicity and that doesn't look at religion, but rather looks at your rights. Yeah? You can be American Italian, you can be American Jewish, you can be American Muslim, you can be American Christian, but you're American. Likewise with Britain, you can be British Muslim, British Sikh, British Hindu, British Indian, British Pakistani, however you define yourself, the fact is you're a citizen in this country. The EU is not a Christian club, and that's the point I'm coming to. So the analogy to say why can't Muslim countries unite under a Muslim banner is a false analogy, because we have moved out of the medieval era where nations were basically bonding on religion. We have moved into what I call the citizenship era. So if there is a regional cooperation between Pakistan, it should be, and that's why I asked you where you're from, it should be a South Asian regional economic cooperation with India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and the region. And it should not be based on religion. And so that's the point why, uh, why the analogy is wrong. Likewise with the Middle East, there should be a regional cooperation. There are many, many Christians in the Middle East. Egypt is not a Muslim country. It's not. It's a Muslim majority country. And that's why I'm very careful with my terminology. Egypt does not belong to Muslims. It belongs to Egyptians. It's a republic. 20% of Egypt are Coptic Christians. And they've been there before Muslims ever got there. Likewise uh, with Lebanon. Lebanon is not a Muslim country. Yeah? It's a Lebanese country for Lebanese people. So we have to stop defining nations by their religious denomination. Otherwise, we will only reinforce the Islamist narrative that defines people by their faith alone. When Google people, senior Google people like Peter, see you, they don't say, you're a Muslim, and then only treat you as a Muslim. They see you as a man, as a, an Indian, as a Google employee, as whatever else you are. If you're a father, you're a father. If you're a husband, they see you as a husband. They see all of your identities together. They don't stereotype you, put you in a box, and then patronize you just for that one identity of your faith. And I think it's dangerous if we, as Muslims, try uh, inadvertently reinforce the Islamist narrative by insisting that we are only defined as Muslims and as nothing else. Because if you think about it, I will be self-excluding myself from British society if I do that. If I insist that I'm only a Muslim, then I'm not British then I won't be allowed to participate in the democracy of Britain and, and make things easier for other Muslims in this country. Does that make sense? I spent a bit of time on that answer just to make sure that, every, because it's important to, to make that distinction. It does make sense, but yeah. I don't think you've, like if I can take more. One more, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so European identities, they're not just Europeans, they're many things, right? So Muslim identity, we can be Muslims as well as other things. So what's wrong with having uh, unite, they, unity between, uh, right, in which case, if it's multiple, it's done by uh, economy and geography, isn't it? It's not done by religion alone. That's my only point, yeah? So if, if there's a regional cooperation, then there are more Muslims, you know this, there are more Muslims in India than there are in Pakistan, numerically. Yeah. There are more Muslims in India than there are in Bangladesh, right? In fact, there are more Muslims in South Asia than the entire Middle East put together. So, you know, if, if there are more Muslims in India than there are in Pakistan, but India is not defined as a Muslim-majority country, because it's not, um, then where does that leave the Muslims in India? You know, so we need, to be, we need to stop defining it just by religion. India needs to cooperate with Pakistan on an economic and geographic level, not on just a religious level. And that's my point. Next question. Hi. Um, thank you so much for coming. This Pleasure. It's been absolutely fascinating. Um, what I was really interested in was um, you talked about the three different uh, fa facets, I suppose, of... Um, Islamism um, and how each of those builds towards their goals. The methods, you mean, yeah? The, so, for example, the terrorist, yeah, and then yeah, you've yeah. got what the you Revolutionary and the political, yeah. Exactly. And so I completely understand that you draw a distinction between what each of them does activity-wise. But what I would say is that I, the way I see it is that although you may not have been involved in terrorism, you're still involved in the incitement of a huge level of hatred yeah. and all of the things that lead in the end to terrorism, as you described in your time at college when the one of your supporters stabbed mm. another pupil. Um, so I see that you draw a distinction between their activities, but what I was wondering was, do you then draw a distinction between how we should deal with each of those three tenets of the building towards Islam, or sorry, well, towards <laughs> Islamism? Um, and if you do see a distinction between how we should be dealing with them 
what do you think is the most effective approach for each or are they are they all as inherent in creating that hatred um, in each way? Or, I mean, do you believe that they're all equally as inherent in creating mm -hmm. that? Or do you see some as less, less yeah. I don't know, I guess more excusable than others? There's, that's a very good question. And um, let me begin by saying I disagree with the ideology per se. So that means regardless of one's methodology, whether you're political, revolutionary, or militant Islamist, I disagree with Islamism on a base level. I believe it's an intellectually flawed, ahistoric, and un-Islamic ideology. Um, sorry for the hyperbole, but it's important to make that point because uh, I don't want anyone thinking that I have any level of sympathy for the ideology. It's, it's, it's intellectually flawed, it's ahistoric, and it's un-Islamic. It's not the same as the religion of Islam. As for the distinctions within the ideology, that happens even within communism. Um, if anyone who knows that, you know your communist history, I mean, uh, Stalin killed Trotsky with an ice pick, or he sent his henchmen to kill Trotsky with an ice pick in the South Americas. Because every ideology, every dogma, if anyone's seen the film Life of Brian, because it's hilarious, it's actually a great film, Monty Python's Life of Brian, you know, they satirize this, and it's, and it's true. Every dogmatic cause will end up turning in on itself. And Islamism has the same. So the political Islamists hate the terrorists, and the terrorists hate the revolutionaries, and likewise, they all hate each other, because they're competing. And they're competing essentially to the same audience, which is the average Muslim, to convince the average Muslim that they have their true salvation in their hands, and that the methodology that they are adhering to is the true way to go forward. Now, if you know that they're competing and that they hate each other, as a strategist who is dealing on a government level with policy responses, or as a civil society activist, like we are with Khudi in Pakistan, who's working on the grassroots to, to push back that ideological narrative, you can exploit those fault lines as weaknesses, and you can play their differences off against each other to weaken them even more, to encourage the, that hatred, to encourage the level of disagreement and, and, and uh, sectarianism within Islamism so that the average Muslim realizes that these guys can't even get it right themselves. They're fighting each other. And do you think that happens? Oh, yeah, definitely it does. Definitely. I've been involved in some of it. Yeah, they yeah, yeah. They do work off of that. Yeah, yeah, they do. Uh, and it's clever. But you have to do it in a way that doesn't legitimize the ideology itself. Yeah? That's important. So, uh, for example, uh, we've, we've been involved in advising uh, governments, including the British government, that ministers should not share platforms with senior Islamists, even if they're nonviolent, just like they would not share platforms with racists, even if the racist was a nonviolent person, right? Because racism can also be nonviolent. But Islamism believes in homophobia, anti-Semitism. It believes in uh, stoning people to death. It believes in uh, all sorts of human rights abuses, anti-women views. And so it's worse than racism in many respects. And so because white people are generally comfortable with not cooperating with white racists, and they're uncomfortable with telling brown people that there are elements of their views that are bigoted because they don't want to be painted as racist, and it's a form of reverse racism because, of course, our culture is bigoted anyway, and the more bigoted we are, the more authentic we are. That sort of perverse, reverse racism colonial view needs to change and needs to stop, and that's part of what we're involved in trying to to, to challenge. And, and Hizbut Tahrir isn't a proscribed organization, is it? It's not, it's not no. illegal. This is a second aspect of the relevance of your question, that we do need to draw a distinction between values and where we stand morally towards these groups and the law. I would never endorse the BNP, for example, but I would defend their right to exist as a legal entity as long as they're not violent. Right? So the BNP is legal in Britain, as is Hizbut Tahrir, and they should both remain legal uh, because they're non-violent even though they both preach hatred. This is kind of what I wanted to get at, actually. Um, it's kind of like, I understand that it's legal, but it seems like the activities that you carried out when you were part of that organization were as damaged, well, in my mind, they're as damaging and as they have as much impact as terrorists, the terrorist cells and so on would have. Um, it might not be quite so obvious up front, but it seems to be just as negative. And so, I mean, it's the same with the BNP here, like their activities and what they do and what they encourage is so negative that you create Brevix. And an atmosphere of... Oh, yeah, you create Anders Brevik in Norway. Yeah, so basically. and you create yeah. more violence. So, yeah. I mean, you may not be the one carrying out the violence, but you're still creating a huge potential for it. So I right. understand that it's legal to have these organizations, but that's kind of the, that's kind of the crux of the matter, I suppose. Is should it... I mean, it's a very complex question, but should it be when you are part of an organization that incites so much hatred and can cause so much damage, yeah. should that be viewed as legal? So the question is, where do you draw the line? Um, if it, the, currently, it's illegal in Britain to directly incite violence, to directly incite it. It's not illegal to incite extremist thought, which is what the BNP and my former group do. 
Uh, I think the line has been drawn correct. I think it, I'm a fan of Orwell. I've read 1984. I think it's dangerous territory. I think Google believes this as well. It's dangerous territory if you start censoring ideas. What you need to do instead is empower alternative ideas. Um, I think part of the problem in the Middle East and why the Arab uprisings happened is because secular dictators were trying for too long to shut down ideas and justify their own dictatorships by saying, if you don't support us, the extremists will come in power. We know what that leads to in the end. It leads to torture, it leads to oppression and tyranny, and it leads to the Islamists gaining credibility because they're the only credible opposition left as a result. So I think that the, the wiser course of action would be to draw the line where British law currently stands, and that's to say um, we won't uh, tolerate inciting, directly inciting violence, but as for extremism, we will encourage and support those civil society initiatives through industry, technology, uh, third sector organizations that try and build capacity to challenge extremism within civil society. Thank you, Thank you so much. I think we're getting close to the end, but time for one final question. Sir. Uh, first of all, brilliant conversation. I appreciate it. Uh, as a, a New Yorker um, that was in New York at the time, that this is just s tremendously uh, insightful. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, wanted to get your feelings on uh, torture. On, uh, on do you feel it actually brings out the truth? Uh, is it uh, uh, demeaning? And, and I would just love, love your insight on that. Okay. Uh, as it's a very hot topic in, in America, and I'm sure it is yeah. worldwide. Yeah. Um, can, I, can I borrow your book again? Sure. So um, in this book, um, being from New York, uh, there's a chapter that's called The Polemic. Um, I encourage you to read it, but please read it and remember what I'm like now so you don't hate me. Um, because the polemic is simply my um, initial gut reaction to 9-11 as an Islamist. Even though we weren't terrorists, my emotions, of course, were still fully in line emotionally with the, with the cause and the struggle. And I had defined America as the enemy. So um, this chapter, the polemic, begins, it's chapter 16. So I just wanted the chapter number for you. It begins with uh, three pages of a, essentially a polemic. It's a rant. But it's the rant I would have said when 9-11 happened at the time. It's how I would have felt, and I, it's how I did feel. I remember feeling this, and I remember actually preparing this type of a speech in my own mind. So do read that. As for your question on, uh, on torture, I suppose there are a few things here that make me somewhat biased, but hopefully in a good way. Uh, being an amnesty adopted prisoner of con conscience, um, being a victim of torture, and being a law student who studied these issues from a legal perspective, uh, I could never endorse torture in any condition or in, for any justification. The red herring of a ticking time bomb scenario, which is often used, is that, you know, what if you have someone who definitely knows where a bomb's going to go off and unless you torture them, you won't uh, get the answer, is in the real world, essentially when it translates into the real world, is only possible when you're in a courtroom and you've got an agent who's accused of torturing somebody, and his defense is it was a ticking time bomb defense, and we're expected to believe him. And there's, of course, no guarantee that he's telling the truth. He's a torturer. There's no guarantee that that's the real reason that he was torturing somebody. In the real world, you don't know what's in that person's head, and you don't know what's in the tortured person's head, which is why legal checks exist. It's to stop an abuse of power, because, of course, any abuse of power is justified. If I if I saw somebody about to murder my loved ones in front of me, I would use serious and severe and sustained violence to stop them. But that doesn't mean I could d justify that violence in, in, in the court of law. So there's a difference between what's a personal defense and a personal justification and what must be put up to public scrutiny. I don't believe torture can ever, be, can ever pass that public scrutiny test. And in this book, um, the prologue begins with a conversation I had with George Bush about this because in his house in Texas, uh, he was quite funny, actually, because he in, ended up sort of suiting that caricature that, I, um, uh, that the people generally have of him. So we were talking, and he said, tell me about your story. And I said, well, you know, um, I said everything I've just said here today. And when I got to the Egypt dungeon bit, and I said, you know, and we witnessed torture in Egypt, he, he sort of went, stop right there. <laughs> That's a very bad American accent, but forgive me. I have to, <laughs> I have to carry on with it because it's, uh, it was so funny. And I, I looked at him. I was shocked why, why he stopped me midway through sentence when I used the word torture. And he looked at me right in the eye, and he said, uh, how do you define torture? Now, of course, this is George Bush who legalized waterboarding, yeah? So, you know, obviously you know what he's getting at. So I, I thought, what do I do here? Do I insult him in his own house? What, how do I respond to that? So it's in the prologue. Um, 
And so the answer, you'll have to read the book to find out what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the perfect cue to say that there are a few books available. I don't know if there's enough for everybody, but it's a first come, first serve here at the front. Uh, we're out of time. Thank you so much, Majid. Uh, Pleasure. Thank, you, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.